Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Sri Ram. Uh, I'm a faculty member at the University of Washington, Seattle, also uh, working on this project called Eigenlayer. Today, I'm here to talk about uh, how MEV intersects with restaking. And the subtitle of the talk is Mycelial Networks at the Root of the Dark Forest. So mycelia are these like fungi that help connect and interconnect the roots of various trees, basically helping them pass along nutrients to each other. So we think of restaking as uh, basically something like that. And in this talk, we're going to kind of examine how MEV kind of MEV intersects with restaking and how we can think about it. Okay, so what is MEV, right? One way to define MEV, there are many different generalizations of this, but one way to define MEV is it is it arises from the freedom of block proposers to order transactions. So the protocol, uh, for example, in Ethereum, the consensus protocol constrains various actions of block proposers, but the that is still a remarkable amount of freedom when it comes to transaction ordering. And this gives rise to both markets as well as some negative externalities. And one example of a clearly negative externality is reorgs. So for example, if there's a block proposer and they see there is some like valuable transactions in a previous block, they may want to reorg the chain because of this. And um, while something like this is uh, much more likely with proof of stake and much more difficult with proof of, proof of much more much easier with proof of work and more difficult with proof of stake because there is a certain amount of voting accumulating, in, for example, in Ethereum today. Uh, one way to mitigate this is by using uh, things like single slot finality. So in proof of stake, what happens is like once you have enough votes cast on a given block, then you can actually move on uh, and finalize that block. And any finality which breaks, if two blocks are proposed, with different orders, then the, the block proposals can be slashed. So one way of thinking about it is the mitigation is possible. The mitigation is possible because there is a certain amount of staking and there is a certain amount of slashing. And one way we can think about this is if we want to generalize this. So what is happening here is single sort finality is basically a commitment from block proposals to hold a certain rule. Even though they have a certain ordering freedom, they cannot exceed a certain bound on the ordering freedom because they've made a certain commitment. In the case of finality, a commitment not to re-arc. And a commitment not to re-arc is enforced because of slashing. And essentially, one way of thinking about how to generalize this is if there were a mechanism to do programmable staking and slashing, then block proposers can commit to more such rules and this gives rise to new kinds of terrible commitments that block proposers can make. That gives rise to more interesting uh, mechanisms to man manage MEV. So before we go and explore some of these interfaces, I just want to give a high-level overview of what is restaking through the lens of uh, Eigenlayer, the first restaking protocol. So what happens in Eigenlayer is if you're an Ethereum staker, you know, block proposers are Ethereum stakers. So if you're an Ethereum staker, you stake in Ethereum, and then you make a credible commitment on the Eigenlayer protocol. It's just a series of smart contracts on which you can set your withdrawal credentials. And in when you set your withdrawal credentials, you can basically uh, opt in into new commitments with the same stake. So you could be running middlewares, but you could also run more particularly commitments on how to run your transaction ordering preferences. And here, uh, you know, just to give a kind of mental model for how this uh, this collective works is it's a really a two-sided market. One side is Ethereum stakers who opt in uh, into securing these new services or to holding by the ordering commitments. Each middleware contains like an off-chain container that you download and run. And it also contains a new uh, smart contract that you have to write. The Eigenlayer itself is just a smart contract on Ethereum, which which is a container which, is, which holds your withdrawal credentials. And um, the Eigenlayer contracts can talk to any middleware contract and uh, enforce the series of like registration, payment, and slashing conditions. 
So that's the primitive of restaking. It's called restaking because you're staking in Ethereum core as well as uh, opting into other kinds of commitments. Okay, so what I'm going to do with the rest of the talk is give like a few examples of, you know, what are the possibilities at this interface. I'll also talk a little bit about what are some negative externalities that we want to think about and mitigate in this uh, interface. One example is uh, event-driven activation. So what is going on here is imagine that there is a, a, a lending protocol or there is, let's say, CryptoKitties. And if you're on a CryptoKitty, there's, you know, there's this concept called the birth of a CryptoKitty. In a lending protocol, there's a concept of either refueling your collateral or liquidating somebody. And these are essentially event-driven actions. Event-driven actions basically means if the state of the Ethereum protocol is something, then uh, it, the Ethereum blockchain is something, then a certain event needs to be triggered. This is like a cron job in uh, Linux. And right now, we do not have a need to blockchain framework to do this. Event-driven activations all happen potentially off-chain. And what you can do with Eigenlayer is if like block proposals are restaked on Eigenlayer, then they can opt in to fulfill certain event-driven activation services. And basically what, and if the transaction that you need to trigger is, is a function purely of the Ethereum state, then what happens is if the, uh, since the, uh, for example, in this case, the uh, collateral refueling or repayment or any of these actions is actually a deterministic function of the Ethereum state, and the block proposer who's creating this block actually has made a credible commitment on this event driven activation service, then essentially they have to include that liquidation or CryptoKitty's birth or whatever that is. Otherwise, the proposer can get slashed. So, you know, what is happening here is uh, there's already markets for this. For example, there's Gelato and Keeper and Chainlink Keepers and so on, which actually do services like this. But there is no tethering between that service and the block proposer. And so what happens is there is a non-attributability. If a Gelato triggers a transaction and the transaction did not get included, it's not attributable whether Gelato actually triggered the transaction and like the proposer didn't include it or something else happened in the middle. Because things are not attributable, you do not get like strong cryptoeconomic guarantees of these actions. But once you have strong crypto economic guarantees of these actions, you actually change the structure of the protocol quite a bit because now, for example, what happens is like you, let's say if you know that like uh, people can set up like collateral refueling within a few blocks because there is some significant fraction of proposers opted into this market, then what could happen is uh, for a margin lending or for stable coins or any other protocol, the over collateralization ratio is basically just the time to liquidation. So because you can have very tight time to liquidation, you can actually build much more efficient financial protocols if you had event driven activation. So this is one example of how MEV and something like restaking can interact with each other. Um, I'll give another example, which I've talked about before called partial block auctions. Uh, we called it also MEV Boost Plus Plus. And the core idea here is uh, MEV Boost is a mechanism to uh, to sell your entire block to a block builder. And uh, instead, you can think of, we can think about whether it is possible to sell only portions of the block to the block builder. And the main reason why only the entire block is sold in the MEV Boost market is if a block proposer double signs a block header, then they will get slashed. So by having them commit to signing a block header, we get a credible commitment that they will actually include that entire block. But by opting into something uh, like Eigenlayer, a block proposer can express much more fine-grained degrees of freedom. For example, saying that I will include this, uh, this uh, a chunk with this hash as the prefix of my block, and the remaining I have freedom to fill in myself. So that's the high-level idea. I mean, I could just dive into like one level more detail here. The idea is that block builders can send a certain uh, portion of the block, which is, you can call it the builder part, and uh, a block uh, proposer basically 
includes the builder part at the front of the block and the remaining is a freedom from the block proposer to include whatever transactions they want at the end of the block. So instead of the block proposer selling the entirety of the block, they're only selling one portion of the block and they have freedom to fill in whatever they want at the end of the block. And why is a mechanism like this interesting is because now block proposers can express their own agency in figuring out how to fill the rest of the block. And uh, this, you know, if you look at the whole MEV Boost architecture, it is tailored around actually making sure that block proposers remain decentralized. And, but if the block proposers are decentralized but have no agency in expressing any transactions, then it's not clear what, what benefit that is. But in a mechanism like this, if the block proposers can express their agency, then you actually get something uh, quite powerful. Okay, so there is a lot more details there I don't want to get into, but I just want to keep this conversation at a high level of what are possible synergies of once you have block proposals in Ethereum L1 restaked, what other things can you start doing? Okay, so another thing that you could do is you basically have a bunch of nodes participating in eigenlayer, like let's say a block proposal has opted into this uh, threshold cryptography, then what would happen is uh, transactions that uh, that come in come encrypted to a threshold cryptography method where there is a that is a secret share of the keys among the many nodes, uh, which which are operating which are also restaked on eigenlayer. And essentially, what they can do is they uh, the client sends in transactions which are encrypted to the uh, threshold group, and once the transactions are committed with the and encrypted with the threshold group, uh, an eigenlayer pro block proposer can take in and sign off that they're going to include only a decrypted version of these transactions. And once they re receive the decrypted version of these transactions from the, once the keys, uh, the decryption keys available, you can actually go in and include it, uh, include the right version of transactions. A block proposer that commits to an encrypted transaction but doesn't include the decrypted transaction could get slashed. To, here, there is an honesty assumption on this like keeper group. If the keeper group is majority honest, basically it is possible that uh, the decrypted version of transactions is not included. So one way to protect against this is you would say that uh, if you did not get the decrypted transactions, you have to just waste your block space for that portion of gas that you sold for the, the encrypted lane. And so this helps protect against, like even if a majority of these are dishonest and do not reveal the threshold key, then the block proposer just proposes an empty block. And so the so it's just a, there are a lot of ways to tune the incentives here. But high level idea is because the block block proposer is committing to include the threshold encrypted transactions, they don't include the decrypted ones, then they can get slashed. Okay, so that's another example. Uh, I'll give one more example here before switching to uh, uh, any mitigations. Uh, one example is, you know, is it possible to sell block space futures? So block space futures is like, I want to reserve a portion of block space from this validator in the future. And the idea here is you send your transactions to like a, kind of like a super fast MEV chain. That could be something like Swow. And, uh, you know, this chain needs some amount of reorg resistance and some amount of censorship resistance. And you buy block space a priori and the, uh, you send your transactions to this like super fast chain. And if the transaction gets included in this super fast chain, then a block proposer who has opted into this block space future actually has to include these transactions in the block. And so essentially block proposers can make credible commitments to include transactions from the future block if they get included into the MEV chain. So this is another example of like what, what we can build. And it's possible to take all these different modules and compose them to build a block where some aspect of the blocks come from event driven transactions, some aspects come from auctions sold to builders, some aspects of the transactions come from threshold encrypted lane, some other aspects come from the proposer having their own freedom. So this is in some sense like a modular roadmap for how MEV can be built on, uh, on Ethereum by using something like we say. There are also some risks. I want to just spend the last minute on this. Uh, one risk is because you may need proposers to be more sophisticated, it may need, lead to more centralization if you have mechanisms like this. But one way to contain this centralization 
is by basically if there is a enough of a rich language for the proposer to express their constraints to the builders and to the relays, then the builders and relays can actually satisfy all these constraints, all the proposers. Um, there are also other really interesting things that happen with restaking is because in some of these services, uh, uh, services building on restaked uh, eigenlayer services can only request the more decentralized committees to participate. It's possible for uh, promoting naturally decentralization in Ethereum itself. There is the possibility of cross-domain MEV because the same set of nodes now participate in many different, uh, uh, many different domains or services. And again, the solution here is to opt in to like rich uh, general purpose cross-domain MEV markets like uh, Swout to actually uh, build these things. And finally, there is risk of actually potentially building uh, censorship markets on something like Eigenlayer. I think this is something we can only keep vigil socially and use social consensus to deal with the uh, situations like this. So. Uh, that's a high-level tour of that. I think there are interesting intersections between uh, something like eigenlayer in, or a general restaking and MEV and look forward to having uh, discussing with some of you. Thank you.